So, okay, what we have in the first task. Consider the used car market with 100 sellers and 100 buyers, identical. So we have buyers. Two sellers. Number of buyers equals to 100. 100 number of sellers equals to 100 also. Both the buyers and the sellers display risk neutral preferences. What that means? Uh, that means that expected utilities will be linear. Then only 50 good cars, plums, arrive to the market and all our items are lemons. So we have two different types of cars, plums, they are good cars, 50, and lemons, also 50. The buyer's value plums at uh, value 200 to uh, 2,400 and lemons 1,600. So the value for buyers of plums 200 to 2,400 and lemons 1,600. What that means? That means that this is maximal willingness to pay for these two types of cars. The sellers are ready to part with their good uh, or bad cars at the price. Plums, 2,000. Lemons, 1,000. What that means? This is minimal price that uh, sellers, uh, uh, for, for which sellers are ready to uh, sell their goods. Minimal price. Then, Suppose everything is the common knowledge. How many plums and lemons uh, and at which price will be sold in the market and show the market equilibrium on the graph. What, ca uh, what can you tell me? How many, uh, how many cars will be sold? If we know the type of the car, One hundred. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And and why? Uh, because cost of production is less than the cost of of buyers. Uh, not the cost, but yeah, you're right. Because uh, the value for buyers for each type higher than the value of uh, for sellers. Yes, and we will mm -hmm. uh, we will write down it. Always efficient to trade. Why? Because the value of plums for buyers higher than for sellers and for lemons the same. That's why all 100 cars will be sold. It is efficient. Efficient deals. My next question. If, if we have common knowledge, how many markets will we have? Will we consider how many markets? Hmm? Uh, two markets. Two markets. We have here, uh, if we have common knowledge, we have two goods, lemons and plums. And we have two different markets for lemons and plums. Two markets. Let us uh, draw the graphs and then uh, write down something analytically, but it is not interesting. The main part is the graph. We will draw two graphs for two markets. Here will be plums, here lemons. Quantity of plums, quantity of lemons, price of lemon, price of plum. Let us start uh, to find equilibrium. We should uh, draw demand and supply. Let us start from supply. It is about sellers. Okay. Each uh, supply curve, we uh, we begin to draw 
from zero price to infinity. So if the price is very, very small, no one wants to sell their car, yes? And the, the first price at which they are willing to sell is 2,000. So if the price is between zero and 2,000, the quantity supplied is zero. Then if the price is 2,000, it doesn't matter for our sellers to sell or not to sell, yes? Because uh, they will not have profit. The profit will be zero for such price. So the quantity supplied will be between zero and the number of sellers with plums, between zero and 50. And then if the price is higher than 2,000, the quantity supplied will be 50. Because uh, each seller of plum will want to sell their good. Same for lemons. Zero uh, quantity supplied zero between zero and one thousand. Then between zero and fifty, and then all fifty. Please ask uh, your questions. Is this clear? Next. Now we should draw the demand. The demand we start uh, we start to draw from infinity price and to zero, from up to down. So if the price is very very big, no one wants to buy. Yes, and the first price for which uh, buyers will be willing to buy the plum is two thousand four hundred. So if the price is higher than 2,400, the quantity demanded will be zero. Then, if the price is exactly 2,400, it doesn't matter for our buyers to buy or not to buy because their consumer surplus will be zero. So the quantity demanded will be between zero and the number of buyers, 100. And then if the price is lower than 2,400, everybody wants to buy the plum. So the quantity demanded will be 100. This is the demand for plums. And we see where is equilibrium, where demand crosses the supply. For them is the same. If the price is very, very high and um, up to uh, how much? One one thousand six hundred. It's over here. Quantity demanded will be zero. Then between zero and one hundred, and then one hundred. This is the demand for lemons. This is equilibrium. Okay, uh, I will write down for you, for example, uh, uh, analytically uh, the supply and demand for lemons. Uh, as an example, please uh, write down analytically for plums uh, by yourself. The supply for lemons will be zero if the price is between zero and 1,000. Then between zero and, uh, and 50 if the price is equal to 1,000. And then 50 if the price is higher than 1,000. This is the supply, the demand is equal to zero if the price is higher than 1,600. Then from zero to 100, if price is exactly 1,600 and 100, if the price is between zero and 1,600. Or plums, so write down by yourself. What do you know about our equilibrium? So, plums, quantity, uh, quantity that will be sold, equilibrium quantity for plums is 550. Equilibrium price for plums is 2,400. Why? Because here we have, with, with such price, with such equilibrium price, 
we have 50 sellers and 100 buyers. Yes? That's why uh, our, our consumers will compete with each other for the good. That's why they will pay a lot. They will pay their maximum willingness to pay. But let us write down that this price is uh, will be in equilibrium if buyers have no bargaining power. What that means? If we will have the information now at us that uh, our uh, buyers have the same bargaining power as sellers, then the price, the equilibrium price will be between 2,000 and 2,400 in the middle. If uh, we will have information that our buyers have, barg uh, have all bargaining power, then the equilibrium price will be minimal price for which our sellers will be willing to sell the plant, 2,000. But now uh, our consumers uh, do not uh, does, do not have their bargaining power, so the price will be their maximum willingness to pay. Uh, market for lemons, quantity 50, equilibrium price 1,600. If buyers have no bargaining power, then let us uh, compute uh, the consumer surplus and producer surplus. Consumer surplus will be 50 plums are bought and the difference between maximum willingness to pay the value for buyers and the price is how much? Zero, yes? Plus 50 lemons are bought multiplied by the surplus for each buyer of this type of good. And this is zero. Produce a surplus. 50 plums are sold and uh, the profit margin is how much? Price of plum minus min minimal willingness to sell. Plus 50 lemons are sold. Price of lemon minus minimal willingness to sell for uh, owners of lemons. And this is how much? 50 multiplied by 400. plus uh, 50 multiplied by 600. And this is 50,000. And on the graph, this area is all producer surplus for owners of plums, and this is producer surplus for owners of plums. If we sum up these two producer surpluses, then we will have 5,000. Yes, please, questions. Is PL equal to 100 and, or 1,600? Yes. This price, you see? Okay. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can write, or I will tell you, that exact value of surplus depends on the distribution of the bargaining power be between buyers and sellers, but we explained it. It depends on the equilibrium price. Yes. Next. In the next point, we will have uh, asymmetric information. Now, when the buyer uh, go to the market, he uh, does not understand what type of car uh, is uh, presented. no longer observes the car's type. What that means? Now, in such situation, in the station of asymmetric info, uh, how many markets will we have? Only one. Only one mm -hmm. market? Cars. 
Yes, and that's all. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Plum 11, it is car for us. In such situation, we begin our discussion from the informative side. Note. Begin from informative side. In our task, who is more informative right now? Buyers or sellers? Buyers. Because sellers know what they sell. Yes, and we begin from sellers. We begin from those who have more information right now. Those who have more info. In our task, they are sellers. Let's draw the graph. Now we have one market, cars. Here will be quantity, here price, and we begin from sellers. So we begin from supply. What do we know about supply? Now all, all cars are presented in the market. Either uh, we begin from bottom to up. If the price is very, very small, no one wants to sell their cars. And the first price, from which they are willing to sell is 1,000, is the minimal willingness to sell for lemons. So the, the supply, will, or the quantity supplied will be zero. If the price between zero and 1,000, then only lemons, will, uh, if the price is 1,000, only lemons will want to sell. So the quantity supplied will be between zero and 50. Then, if the price is uh, higher than 1,000, but less than 2,000, only lemons will want to sell because for plums, it is, uh, it is a too small price. So the quantity split will be exactly 50. Then if the price is 2,000, plums, uh, lemons will want to sell and plums will think to sell or not. So the quantity supplied will be between 50 and 100. And then if the price is higher than 2000, all cars will be presented in the market. The quantity supplied will be 100. This is the supply. Then, what information we know from this uh, from this supply curve? We know that if the price is very high and uh, up to two thousand, then who is on the market? In the market, in this situation. Both types are presented. Yes, if the price is uh, higher than 2000, here will be lemons and plums. Use the pencil to, uh, to write down it. Then, if the price is between 1000 and 2000, we know that only lemons are presented. And if the price is lower, nobody. All this information is, is known for our buyers. And we start discussing the demand. What about the demand? We start our discussion from price infinity and down. If the price is very, very high, the quantity demanded is zero. No one wants to buy. What is uh, uh, what our consumers know in uh, this situation, if prices are very high, that and lemons and plums are presented in the market. So what will be the maximal willingness to pay for our uh, consumers? Uh, one uh, 1,600 because they're not sure 
This is for lemons, but we know that and lemons and plums are presented. In this situation. The 2000, maybe. Why? Oh, 2000, why? We, uh, if the presence of plums and lemons are equal, we, we, we calculate expected value. Yes, exactly. Yes. If we know that and lemons and plums are presented, we will pay maximum willingness to pay will be expected value for us. How to count expected value? We know that 50 plums are, are presented. So this will be 50 divided by 100. It's a total number of sales multiplied by our uh, maximum willingness to, play, to pay for plums, 200, 2,400 plus 50 divided by 100 multiplied by 1,600. 1, and this is 2,000, yes. So our maximum willingness to pay in this situation is 2,000. So the quantity demanded will be zero if the price is between 2,000 and infinity. Then, if the price is exactly 2,000, what we know? We know that in this situation, lemons and plums are presented in the market and we are willing to pay this, uh, this sum, 2,000. So, uh, but buyers, they, uh, they will not, they, uh, they think that uh, it doesn't matter for, for them to buy or not to buy so, because they will not get a expected surplus. Yes, the expected surplus will be zero. So they pay 2,000 and they value to, uh, 2,000. So the quantity demanded will be between zero and 100. Then if the price is lower than 2,000, a little bit lower than 2,000, what will be the quantity demanded? What uh, could you tell me? If the price is a little bit lower than 2,000, quantity demanded will be how much? Exactly one, uh, 100. Why? Because at uh, 2,000, they are indifferent. Mm -hmm. And if the price is uh, a little bit lower than 2,000, yeah. then what we know that uh, if the pri if prices are lower than 2,000, only lemons are presented in the market. Yes? Ah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the quantity demanded will be how much? 50. What? Quantity demanded. No. Why? Why? Because there are only 50 lemons. No, we now speak about uh, buyers, not, uh, not, uh, uh, not uh, sellers. We speak about buyers. If the price is a little bit lower than 2,000, we understand that now all the lemons are presented and maximum willingness to pay for lemons for us is 1,600. So if the price is so way near 2,000, we will not buy. We will not want to buy. So the quantity demanded will be zero up to the price 1,600. Because now there are only lemons presented. Then if the price is 1,600, when uh, this is our maximum willingness to pay for lemons and we are indifferent to buy or not. So the quantity demanded will be between zero and 100 because we have 100 buyers. And then if the price is lower, quantity demand will be zero. So this is the demand. Uh, why we have two red lines, uh, horizontal, at 2,000 and 1,600? Because so, uh, here we have the change in our knowledge. One more time, I will explain one more time our structure. If the price is very, very high, we know that in the market, and lemons and plums are presented. That's why we're willing to pay only the expected value, 2,000. So if the price is higher than 2,000, our quantity demanded is zero. If the price is exactly 2,000, then 
we know that in this situation and lemons and plums are presented so we are indifferent to buy or not to buy this uh, good this car so the quantity demanded will be between zero and 100 this horizontal line then if the price is a little bit lower than 2000 then we know we switch yes we have the change about in our knowledge we know that only lemons are presented plums will not sell uh, will not sell their goods uh, for prices lower than 2000 and we know it we know that only lemons are presented so we will not pay for lemon uh, something higher than 1600 so the quantity demanded will be zero and then if the price is 1,600, the quantity demanded is between zero and 100 because we're indifferent to buy lemon or not to buy because we know that there are only lemons in the market right now. And then if the price is lower, then everybody wants to, to buy the lemon. Okay. How many, uh, how many equilibrium, equilibrium yeah. How many equilibrium will we have here? Two. I will I will say uh, two types, but uh, infinite number of equilibriums because we will have this one and this one. Ah yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's write down analytically our demand and supply for you. Supply will be zero if the price is between zero and one thousand, then between zero and fifty if the price is exactly one thousand, then fifty if the price between one thousand and two thousand, then between fifty and one hundred if the price is exactly two thousand. And then 100 if the price is higher than 2000. This is about the market supply. Market demand is zero. If the price is higher than 2000, then between zero and 100, if the price is exactly 2000, then again zero if the price between. 1,600 and 2,000. Then again, between zero and 100, if the price is exactly 1,600, and then 100, if the price is lower, it is between zero and 1,600. Then we will have two types of equilibrium first when the price is equal to 1600 and the quantity 50 and only lemons are sold and the next equilibrium when the price is 2000 and the quantity that is sold is between 50 and 100. We will have in this situation uh, efficient equilibrium. Where is the efficient equilibrium? Here. 1,600. This, this equilibrium is not efficient because uh, only 50 cars are sold. And efficient, uh, we wrote down that uh, it is efficient to trade, to sell all, ca all cars, yes? So here we will have only one efficient equilibrium, the most efficient one, when all cars are sold, all 100 cars. This one is the most efficient equilibrium.
Well, this equilibrium read, uh, let us uh, uh, count the uh, consumer surplus and producer surplus. One more time, most efficient. Equilibrium is when all cars are sold for price 2000. So the consumer surplus for those uh, who bought plums. 50 cars multiplied by the difference between the value for plums and the price. This will be 50 multiplied by how much? 2,400 minus 2,400. This is 20,000. Consumer surplus for those who bought lemons is how much? 50 cars are bought. They value these cars at 1,600, but pay 2,000. So this will be minus 20,000. So consumer surplus in total is zero. What about producer surplus for plums, uh, for, for sellers of plums? They sell, they sell 50 cars for price 2,000, but they value them at 2,000 also. This will be zero. Producer surplus for lemons, 50 cars are sold for price 2,000, and they value these cars at 1,000. And if we compare this most efficient equilibrium with the uh, with the situation of with the situation of perfect information, what we can tell? We can tell uh, that uh, who is better or who is worse off. Those who bought lemons are worse off. Those uh, who bought plums are better off. Yes, yes. Those who, uh, those who sell plums are worse off and those who sell, uh, those who sell lemons are better off, yes? Mm -hmm. For these, uh, please, questions. No questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let us uh, do the fourth. This is the second point. Let us uh, do the fourth point. On the same graph, I will show you on the same graph. Point four. We have in point four also symmetric information, but number of lemons right now is 70. So the number of plums is 30. What will be the change on the graph? So lemons will be 70 here. So the supply will move here. This black will be a new supply. If the number of lemons grow up. But what about the demand? The demand will also change. Why? Because uh, there will be the change in expected value. Yes? Expected value will be how much? What is the probability to, uh, to buy the plum right now? It is 0 0.3 multiplied by the value for plum, 2,400. Plus the probability now to, to buy lemon is 0 0.7. And we value this at 1,600. And this is 1,840. So we start uh, discussing the demand from price infinity. So if the price is higher than 1,840, uh, 1, the quantity demanded will be zero. Yes? So if the price 
is lower than 2000, then the quantity demanded will be also zero because we know that there will be only lemons. And it will be zero up to 1600. So we will not have right now two horizontal lines. We will have only one horizontal line and only one equilibrium. New equilibrium will be the price 1,600 and quantity only for lemons, 70. Yes, and we will have only inefficient equilibrium. What can you tell me about this situation? This situation, uh, uh, what can you tell me about first fundamental welfare theorem? Is it works here or not? Not works because a mark is not complete. Uh, it can work, it can work if we have uh, this most efficient equilibrium. If all cars are sold, then the first fundamental welfare theorem will work. But here we have only inefficient equilibrium. So we uh, write down that first fundamental welfare theorem fails. Market equilibrium is not Pareto efficient. And how, uh, how we name this situation if there are only lemons are sold? This is uh, the presence of lemons is the negative externality for owner of plums. And uh, uh, how, uh, how you name this situation? What is the problem here? When be, uh, because uh, there are lemons, plums leave the market. This problem is called adverse selection. This about point four. One more. If we will have vice versa, if we will have more plums and less lemons compared to the first or to the second point, what we will have? We will have expected value higher, and then we will have the set of Pareto efficient equilibrium. Mm -hmm. We'll have the set of artificial equilibrium if we will have more plums and an efficient one, and an efficient one. So I start raising and we will do this the third point. Suppose each buyer can pay cost gamma 
and call an auto mechanic who is able to inspect the offered car. What he can tell? With probability 0 0.85, the mechanic truly reveals the goods type. What that means? Um, okay. And with complementary probability, he cannot arrive to any conclusion. He will not help. If the goods type is revealed, the buyers get all the bargaining power and pays the seller exactly the cost associated with the item. So if we truly, if we know what will be the type, if the mechanic helps us, then we will pay minimal willingness to sell for lemon and for plum. We'll have all, all bargaining power. Find the values of gamma such that the buyer weekly prefers to call the mechanic. So we'll, we should find such, such fees for mechanic that we will want to call him. So how to solve this? How to answer this question? A 2000 and 400 minus a 2000 and it, uh, it will multiply it by 0 0.85. I think and it's we know, and we know the minimum mm -hmm. amount of money. It, it will be a little bit more complicated. We should compare expected utilities. When we call mechanic or not, let us write down the expected utility if we call mechanic. What will be our expected utility? With probability 0 0.85, he will truly reveal the type for us. So what is the probability that he will tell that this is lemon? 0 0.5. So we will pay our surplus will be our value for lemon minus the price for lemon. And this is CL. Plus in 50, uh, uh, in 50 percent situations, he will tell that this is exactly the plum. So the probability is 0 0.5, he will tell that this is the plum and our surplus will be the value of plum minus the price for plum and this is, mm -hmm. Plus, with probability 0 0.15, he will not help us. And uh, in what situation we will still stay. Let us co uh, consider the most efficient equilibrium uh, in the case of a symmetric information. Most efficient equilibrium. So, with probability 0 0.5, we'll have plum plus with probability 0 0.5, we will have lemon minus the price that we paid. And the price here was 2000, yes? This will be our surplus, expected surplus. And if we call mechanic, we will pay him anyway. So minus gamma. We should put all the numbers and count, and this will be a 400, 400, I forgot, let's check. Four hundred twenty-five minus gamma. This is the expected utility if we call the mechanic. Expected utility if we do not call the mechanic, how much? The same, with probability 0 0.5, we will have plum. With probability 0 0.5, we will have lemon, minus the price that we pay anyway. 
And this will be how much? Zero, yes? So we will benefit to full call mechanic only if Only if he is not too expensive. When our expected utility from calling mechanic is uh, not lower than expected utility if we are not call mechanic. So the fee should be less or equal than 125. This is our answer for the third point. Please ask questions about this task. We take uh, P star from a second. In case of asymmetric information, we can call the mechanic to help us and we consider the most efficient equilibrium here. Okay. Hmm? I, I, I answered your question or not? Can you repeat? I answered your question or what I should repeat? I don't understand, to be honest. Why we take a 2000? Because it was uh, the uh, equilibrium price in case of asymmetric information. If mechanic, uh, if mechanic does not uh, help us, then we stuck in the, uh, we, uh, we do not know what is car here. Yes, what is the type of the car? Where in the case of asymmetric information, and in this case, we consider the most efficient equilibrium. When the price was uh, 2000 and the quantity sold, all cars are sold, 100. Check the graph for the second point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next, second problem. And this is also the classical work. The classical work of Spence, uh, job market signaling. What we have? A perfectly competitive firm is willing to hire one worker. Perfect competitive firm. The workers can be either unskilled or skilled. And if it, he is unskilled, his productivity is one. If he is skilled, productivity is two. And their preferences over wage looks as, as follows. The fraction of skilled workers in the population amounts to P. And then skilled, one minus P. So this is the probability that uh, it is skilled or unskilled worker. The first production function is where LI indicates how many hours an employee of type I works. The firm pays the workers his marginal revenue product. As uh, each perfect competitive firm. For simplicity, normalize the price of the firm's output to unity.
what that means. We know uh, this from, uh, we know this condition, how much we'll pay to our worker. The wage will be uh, the marginal revenue uh, product of labor. What is this? This is the price of, uh, of output multiplied by marginal product of labor. Price is equal to one. Marginal product of labor, what is, uh, what is it? Is the first derivative by labor for our function. Yes? So wage will be equal to the productivity. You see, when we take the first derivative. Point one. Suppose the firm can perfectly observe the type. How much should it pay to each worker's type? What can you tell me? If we see what is the qualification of our worker? The unskilled person is one. One skilled one, a one equals to one. Yes, so two. Mm -hmm. A two, a two. Yes, exactly. If we understand what is the type of the worker, we will pay him his productivity from this. Yes, as we are a perfect competitive firm on both markets, on the market of output and in the market of in the labor market. Second, if we cannot perfectly observe the type. And we know that uh, this is only worker. What will be the wage for him? One point five. Something in the middle. Ah, no, 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 no. Uh, one minus p plus two p. Mm -hmm. One minus p multiplied by a one is plus p multiplied by a two. Expected, expected productivity. Yes. And this is exactly one plus P. In the case of asymmetric information, who is better off and who is worse off? Or what type of worker is better off? What type of worker is worse off? Compare. Unskilled worker is better off. Mm -hmm. Because one plus P is higher than one. Yes. yes. But it is less than V2. So only unskilled benefit. Mm -hmm. Next. Point three. To signal their ability, workers can acquire education measured in years of schooling. However, it does not affect uh, their productivity. The education, however, is costly. So E will be years of schooling. The cost uh, for unskilled to acquire education is E. The cost for unskilled, uh, for skilled workers is E over four. You see that, uns uh, that uh, it is more difficult for unskilled workers to acquire education. Yes? Then. The firm believes that all workers, firm believes, if the education of worker is higher than is star, 
then he is skilled. Otherwise, if the year, years of schooling is lower than this is star worker is unskilled. This is the belief of the firm right now. So how it will happen? Worker will come to, uh, to, uh, to the employee and uh, show the certificate. In this certificate, it is written how many uh, years of schooling he has. So for example, five, I don't know. And what firms believe? If this years of schooling certificate is higher than some is star, so he is skilled and he and we will pay him how much? Four skilled worker, yes, two. If this years of schooling is lower than is star, then we, we believe that he is unskilled and we will pay him as for unskilled worker. Our question is, does there exist a separate in equilibrium in which only skilled workers invest in schooling? Separating. in which only skilled invest in schooling. For such equilibrium to exist, we should have two conditions. First condition is, our skilled workers will want to uh, have education. When it is so, when the utility from having education is higher than uh, when he has no education. If uh, he will have education higher or equal to this E star, let us consider the border, this E star, then if I have such a uh, level of education, I will have the wage too. So the wage will be two, but I had costs. Yes, I have costs on this education. This will be E star over four. And this net utility, net benefit should be uh, should be higher or equal to the citation if I do not have education. If I do not have education, firm will believe that I am unskilled worker and I will have the wage one. From here, we will have two minus E star over four, greater or equal than uh, one. So from here, years of school should be less or equal than four. So for our skilled workers to uh, acquire education, this level, this level will, should be not too high. This uh, years of schooling, this border should be not too high. Because if it, if it is too high, it will be very costly for me. That's why I will say, okay, I'm agree for this wage that is equal to expected value, to expected productivity. Then next, for having separating equilibrium when only skilled workers invest in schooling, our unskilled workers should not want to have education when it will be so. If they will have education, they will uh, firm will believe that they 
uh, that they are skilled. So they will have their wage V2, but the costs for unskilled are E, E star. And this, for not uh, want to have education, this should be less than the, than the V1, minus zero if I do not invest in schooling. From here, here two, here one, we see that this border should be higher than one. If this border is higher than one, then unskilled will not invest in education because it is uh, too costly for them. So we have this uh, interval in which there exists uh, this separating equilibrium. So, so this border should belong from one to four for having such equilibrium. Will unskilled worker will acquire any education in this situation? No, because we have no change in productivity and that's why we have no change in wage. That's why it is optimal not to have education for unskilled worker. Let's write down it. Will unskilled acquire an education? No. Why? There's no change in productivity. And that's why in wage. So for unskilled, it is optimal to have no education. And this, this supports the firm's belief. Yes, firms believes that if our workers uh, have education, so they are skilled. And if no education, they are unskilled. And this supports the firm's beliefs. That's why there exists a separating equilibrium in which only skilled workers acquire education. In which only skilled workers acquire education. That's all uh, for this point. These guys has questions. In the first point, in the first point, the question is the same, but there is the change in costs. How would your answer will change if both types had the same cost of acquiring education? What if the costs for acquiring education is the same and equals to E? What can you tell me? Yes, of E will be one. Oh, oh, once again? No, E equal to one. E is equal to one. No, E should be higher than one and the E should be less or equal to one. There, uh, there will be empty set. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, there will be no separating equilibrium. Let's write down all this. And uh, intuitively, why it is so? Because you see if, if uh, it is uh, the same, if there is the same cost for both types, so our uh, our skilled workers they uh, they do not have advantage in acquiring education. Yes, 
In economic terms, it is called single crossing condition does not hold. And we will write down all this. So in such situation, one should be higher equal to E star and one should be less than E star. This for skilled, this for unskilled. So we'll have empty set. So there will be no separated equilibrium. This is the case because a single crossing condition does not hold. Skilled workers have no uh, advantage in acquiring education. Single crossing condition. Skilled, skilled workers have no advantage in acquiring education. Mm -hmm. So what we will have, we'll, we will not have separating equilibrium. What equilibrium will we have in such situation? So it is not profitable. It, uh, there will be no benefit for skilled to separate themselves. So they will not separate themselves. So everybody will be in uh, the same situation. We will have the same asymmetric information. So what will be the equilibrium wage? One. This will be one for. If nobody separate themselves, so our uh, our firm, she does not know who is presented. Yes, so the wage will be equal to expected wage. One plus productivity. Yes, expected mm -hmm. activity one plus p. This uh, type of equilibrium is called pooling equilibrium when no one can separate themselves. Equilibrium is pulling. По-русски объединяющее равновесие. One of them is the station when everybody has no education because it is costly equals to zero and the wage equals to one plus P. And that's all. Please, about, about this. Можно спросить на русском? Можно, да, все. Я, я закончила там рассказывать, да, типа, все, что я хотела рассказать. Теперь давайте вопрос можно на русском. А для чего вообще вот нам, ну, как бы этому уроку, этой фирме нужно знать, сколько лет мы учились? То есть вот мы учились год, два, и на что это влияет? И, ну, и в смысле вот мы уже, допустим, skilled person, и нам нужно учиться еще, чтобы стать, чтобы им остаться, или что? То есть я не понимаю эту логику. Смотрите, что это такое концепция разделяющего равновесия? Да? Какая, какая проблема существует? Какая проблема существует? Если ты получаешь мало образования, то про тебя думают, что ты плохой работник, и тебе мало платят. Кто хочет, кто хочет от этого отделиться? Хотят хорошие работники действительно доказать, что они хорошие. То есть им выгодно получать, им должно быть выгодно получать хорошее образование, да, то есть ну, там много лет обучения, вот, чтобы, и вот должна считаться, чтобы хорошим было выгодно получать, да, много лет обучения, а плохим невыгодно, тогда у хороших получится, да, действительно доказать, что вот мы хорошие, платите нам большую зарплату. Вот. А плохие, им невыгодно получать образование да, большое, ну, там очень дорого. Вот. И плохие будут получать свою зарплату каждому по способности. Вот такая концепция вот этого равновесия. То есть как это происходит? А у нашей фирмы лежит какая-нибудь такая, типа, как такой как документ, да, их там закон, прописанный в фирме, что прямо в нем написано. Так, при найме работников. Каждый работник приносит сертификат, да, там диплом, в котором написано, сколько лет обучения у тебя. Вот. 
и фирма, что ты, во что ты должна верить. Значит, если, если вот тебе приносят диплом, и там написано, что количество лет обучения больше, чем у тебя в документе, значит, это хороший, плати ему большую зарплату. Вот, если у него в дипломе написано количество лет обучения меньше, чем в твоем документе, значит, это плохой работник, плати ему и по его способностям низкую зарплату. Вот и все. Вот такой. И вот нас спрашивают, может ли вот при наших там, издержках на образование и так далее, может ли существовать тако, такая ситуация, равновесная ситуация, что действительно только хорошие, да, вот separate, да, они действительно отделились от плохих, хоть смогли отделиться от плохих и доказать, что они хорошие, получают свою зарплату. А плохие получают свою, потому что не получают образование. Может ли быть при наших условиях такая ситуация? Вот нас такое спрашивают. Это одно из типов равновесия. Второй тип равновесия – это объединяющее равновесие, когда слишком дорого каждому учиться, не получается отделиться, невыгодно отделяться. Да? И хорошие работники думают, ну и ладно, вот, все, значит, я не буду тогда получать образование, потому что оно затратное, да? и всем просто будут платить вот эту вот среднюю заработную плату, и все. Вот, это полын эквилибриум. Вот у нас есть separating эквилибриум и полын эквилибриум. Вот их надо каждый проходить. Вот. А так. разве в реальной жизни бывает такое, что для skilled person обучение стоит дешевле, чем для unskilled? Это же как-то странно. Это, Или... не, это не про то, сколько ты должен платить за обучение, это то, насколько она тебе трудно дается. Но если ты как бы не а, очень да. способна, но тебе, наверное, труднее учиться. Правильно? Это же естественно. Четыре года, то тебе надо еще два года для магистратуры, а для unskilled надо шесть, да? Ну, грубо говоря. Или, или это не так? Не талит? Еще раз, еще раз. Логика в том, что это не сколько ты платишь за обучение, это сколько ты, а, ну, сколько ты усилий да, на это кладешь. Ну, то есть, если ты не очень способный, в принципе, родился, да, то ты будешь очень долго сидеть, там, думать. Ну, то есть, тебе будет очень тяжело учиться. Очень тяжело. А твое время можно перевести в деньги. Ну, может быть, вы, наверное, про то же самое говорите, только вот уже в, в, сразу в деньгах. Ну, вот, а если ты способный, то тебе очень легко учеба дается, у тебя издержки на обучение ниже. Согласны? Mm -hmm. Вот. Если такое условие выполняется, то будет существовать разделяющее равновесие. Если способным легче учиться, то они смогут получить вот лучшее образование, да, то есть может быть такая ситуация, что они отделятся и будут получать более высокую зарплату. Вот. А если всем одинаково трудно учиться, то там способны ты не способны, какая разница, да? ну, то есть у тебя не получится отделиться, то что все одинаковые, да, получается, по сути. Вот, и все. Ну, в плане издержек, да, на обучение. Вот, поэтому вот будут они среднюю зарплату получать. Такие дела. Mm -hmm. вот. mm -hmm. Так, еще, пожалуйста. Давайте пока стирать, что-нибудь еще спросите. Так, кого нет вопросов до следующего вторника? А вот можешь еще узнать, а как скоро будут этот, проверенные наши работы по метеорам? 